Welcome to the Institute of World Politics. As a courtesy to the speaker, we ask that you please silence all devices. For those of you who are new to IWP, we are a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master degree programs, including two online MAs, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you are interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event or visit iwp.edu. To support the work of IWP, please visit iwp.edu slash donate. Today, we will be hearing from Dr. Henry Phil Williams III, who will discuss Turkey's President Erdogan's balancing leading to the 2023 elections. Dr. Williams is currently an adjunct professor at IWP. He also teaches in the International Relations Department of Kulch University in Istanbul, Turkey. He has received degrees and diplomas from Culver Military Academy, the Universities of Virginia, Edinburgh, and Florence, and a PhD in International Law and Diplomacy from the Fletcher School of Tufts University. He has worked on the Mediterranean more than 10 years of his life, including stints in Turkey for eight years doing doctoral research, investment banking for four years, and in university level teaching for four semesters. He also worked in corporate finance on Wall Street for many years. He has published scholarly articles on the Ottoman and Turkish law, as well as his recent book, Turkey in America, East and West, Where the Twain Meet. He has authored many news articles on Turkey and spoken widely on Turkey's domestic and international affairs for many years. Please welcome Dr. Williams. Thank you, Jocelyn. On. Uh, I thank you all for coming. Uh, I personally couldn't be happier to actually be in this building because it's been over two years since I was last here. And when I agreed to do this talk a couple of months ago, I understood that I was going to be the very first live and live streamed program in the building. I gathered that. Uh, I got scooped last night. There was a program last night here, so I am the second uh, to, in, to, to be back here alive and back at this uh, school, which I think is such an extraordinary opportunity for the students that teach here, and I find it to be a wonderful home for me. I wish I didn't, sometimes wish I didn't live as far away as Charlottesville, Virginia. It makes it a little bit harder to stay on top of things uh, here in Washington, uh, but I do it and I do it with pleasure. So thank you very much uh, for coming. And uh, without further ado, let's, let's look at uh, President Erdogan's balancing act and these uh, issues that, are, that Tur Turkey and Turks are facing, Turkey and its neighbors are facing, NATO is facing, and America is facing, and I could go on because Turkey is a place, the part of the world that has had an impact on almost all the rest of the world ever since Alexander the Great and his empire, followed by the Romans and then followed uh, by the Ottomans. So where the geography, the story that's told by the geography of Asia Minor uh, is millennia old. And uh, right now we have a, a rather unusual person at the helm uh, steering the co a course for Asia Minor as we know Turkey today. So today I'd like to talk about, uh, give you a little historical background, talk about his first decade, uh, which I say where he was on a roll, his second decade where he seems to have, I would say, lapsed into authoritarianism, and then uh, we'll look at some of his domestic and foreign uh, gunslinging, the net result of which is that he uh, doesn't have uh, as many friends as some of his predecessors have had as prime ministers and later presidents of Turkey. Uh, and the looking at the rising economic turmoil, uh, the concomitant rise of political opposition in Turkey, and its impact on the coming election, which should be June 18th of next year. And then look at uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan's uh, legacy and implications thereof for uh, NATO and America. So all of you in this room, of course, know geography extremely well 
anywhere on on the, on the planet. Uh, in, unless I were to remove the names, half the names you see up there, then you might not get Georgia and Armenia right and might not know where Nagorno-Karabakh is. The reason I put the map here is just to, to give us the setting uh, for my talk, but also to remind, uh, the, to remind all of you and remind the audience that uh, what you see there with Turkey and what you see on that map was very largely the Ottoman Empire for f almost 500 years. So the, the, Turkey is uh, now the residual part of what was an enormous empire that impacts all these areas uh, that I'll be talking about today. So Erdogan, first decade, he seems to be on a roll. Um, I'll give him credit for the economic miracle. I think others uh, created a structure for it, uh, namely Turgut Ozal, a previous president and prime minister. Uh, but it, Turkey went, got on a financial role, uh, economic uh, role, in the early uh, 2000s uh, when he came uh, to power. And he kept that alive and stimulated uh, to considerable effect. One of the things that it did is this, this what became known as an econo economic miracle meant that President Erdogan was in a position uh, to to do things that sometimes didn't seem to be terribly uh, attractive uh, to people within his own country, but more particularly for the purposes of our talk, uh, Europe, NATO, and America. Uh, he began to, to usher in some policies initially uh, domestically, but the first thing he did as prime minister was actually to step in uh, with his new party uh, the Justice and Development Party, or AK Partisi, uh, to step in there on a very narrow vote and say no to America's desire to create a second front in this second uh, Gulf War. Now, certain, uh, I would say that progressive left social political parties in Western Europe and the United States uh, wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt and said, well, you see, he's, he's stood up to America, but he's done it uh, through parliamentary means with a proper election. It shows that Turkey is actually maturing as a democracy. I can guarantee you that in the Department of Defense uh, and, uh, and, and, and the counterparts in Western Europe, uh, red flags were raised about uh, basically slapping America in the face and saying no. We have this incredible base down in the southeastern part of Turkey where we incidentally have 49 or 50 nuclear warheads buried underneath the base, but we wanted that base to, be, to open a second uh, offensive uh, against uh, Iraq and Hussein. And they said no. But people, as I say, were willing to forgive him because Turkey seemed to have gotten away from the old left of center, right of center politics, and maybe this new form, uh, new way of uh, forging uh, political development in Turkey uh, with an Islamist bent uh, could be exactly uh, what is needed here to help Turkey move along to become more westernized, counterintuitively. But maybe they can do it. In fact, people like The Economist de described what Erdogan's party described it as mildly Islamist. Now, having been, having lived on and off and been concerned with uh, Turkey probably since 1974 in my life, uh, I took that with a grain of salt and asked myself, uh, is being mildly Islamist being somehow like uh, mildly pregnant, for example. I'm, I'm not sure there's a mildly. Well, it, it took another decade before he would show his hand and basically, uh, you know, give, give, an, give truth to my own suppositions that, uh, that this was the, the same Erdogan that in 1997, by the secular elite uh, of Turkey, uh, had put that same guy they'd put in jail for six months they put in jail because he wasn't as mildly Islamist as people would like to have believed. It took a while to discover that, but the, the economy uh, rising floated all boats. 
So he's on a roll in this decade. But it starts with a decision that he takes that is, uh, that is problematic in uh, many quarters, uh, not least of all the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, uh, here in uh, Washington. So the next thing that happens is that Erdogan, being mildly Islamist, decides to support the first and then the second intifada in Israel, supports Hamas, uh, much to the chagrin of our Israeli allies. Uh, and interestingly enough, Turkey, after World War II, was the second country in the world uh, to recognize Israel and have had, by and large, good relations with Israel uh, for decades, being the only two theoretical democracies uh, in that part of the world. So what this article captures here toward the end of the, the, end of the decade is you see that uh, Erdogan is getting his way. But every time there is an election and the strength of his party rises, it's, uh, it's grounds for him to go after the opposition that all Islamists have felt if you will, since the founding of the Republic in 1923. And they were fighting for, uh, for political life beginning in the 70s, and they were accepted to some degree because the one thing they shared in common, common with the Kemalist secular elite is that they were both anti-communist. And it was on that basis that the door uh, was opened, and Islamist uh, political interests began uh, to uh, develop. So a couple of parties, including a prime minister, were essentially uh, thrown out of office. Uh, but at the end of the day, the existing centrist parties were so corrupt for so long that come the turn of the century, they were ready to try something new. And here is this former mayor of Istanbul, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, coming in with this mildly Islamist uh, approach uh, to governance of a, an otherwise secular uh, republic. So he takes advantage of this, the cover he gets from, the, from his, the economic miracle to begin purging the Kemalist and secular elements uh, within, uh, within uh, Turkish society. Uh, the particular program that they institute is known as the Ergenikon, where they basically began to accuse any Kemalist secular oriented senior military officials of basically plotting uh, against the government and started to throw them in jail with little or no evidence. Uh, within five to six years, uh, the cream of well-trained, highly recognized, uh, complementarily recognized by their NATO counterparts, highly trained military people, were being replaced by people who, you know, with you know, two, three years before were, you know, first lieutenants are now rising and becoming uh, colonels and senior military officials without an awful lot of uh, experience and military training, but ha uh, had a political bias in favor of the government. So this was tolerated again because things seemed to be going so well. In fact, we thought if it, if it weren't for a couple of votes, we thought you know Turkey might begin to actually accelerate the. Uh, you a key process, uh, and they were on. They, they thought they were on a road to seriously being considered to become members of the EU. And lo and behold, uh, their their wishes were doused when uh, Cyprus becomes independent, uh, becomes a member of the EU, and Cyprus and Greece and, and Greece basically veto uh, the prospect of Turkey going beyond the first couple of books of the 32 books that you need to complete uh, to, to be considered uh, to coming into the EU. So this is a, a difficult situation for Turkey. This is kind of a setback. Uh, and then Erdogan, I think personally, I think he comes to the conclusion at the end of the day, they don't want us. My own conclusion is that at the end of the day, he's probably right. What many people might find counterintuitive is that I personally, after all the decades that I've lived in Turkey, I personally think Turkey is, itself is best suited not in the European Union. I think there is more to be gained by the European Union and Turkey 
them not being members than trying to make them and make them work uh, in in a cultural environment that really is antithetical to an awful lot of the, the cultural uh, history of that country. They do better off uh, just being part of the customs union. So this is this first decade, and he's things are looking good, and people are overlooking things because of the miracle, and he's basically purging the secular. Uh, uh, military seniority uh, from rank and position, either putting them in jail or accusing them uh, and them having to step down for their jobs. And uh, so all of a sudden we get into the next decade uh, where people begin to see the handwriting uh, on the wall. I think the, the, the particular event, uh, 2011 election, was uh, the best political outcome for uh, Erdogan as prime minister and leader of the uh, De Justice and Development Party, the best political outcome that they, that they ever got. They got 49% of the vote all on their own. So they needed you know, very small uh, coalition support to take control of parliament at the time, which they did. So it begins looking very strong politically and the first thing that, that happens that, be, that sends up a red flag is his reaction to this public protest which broke out in Istanbul. Uh, people did not want the main square in Turkey, Taksim, in Istanbul, Turkey. They didn't want it to become another department store to make some other uh, Turkish oligarch richer. And oh, by the way, build a uh, police and military bar barracks also in this famous square in Istanbul, Taksim. Taksim means to divide. That's where the water was originally divided into all areas uh, of Turkey. So his reaction to that uh, was, you know, tear gas, uh, people died, um, 8,000 people were injured, and all of a sudden, uh, not just domestically, uh, the opposition kind of begins to come back to life again. But internationally, some people began to look and say, really, is this, is this, is this the parliamentary parliamentarian that, uh, that we thought we were getting, this mildly Islamist thing? And so the people began to look back and look at the problems with Israel and, and realize what was going on with the military, and all of a sudden began to have questions uh, about uh, his leadership. So this second decade it ends up, beginning with Gezi Park, you end up with a, an attempt in, in 2016 uh, to overthrow uh, the government. Long story about that, uh, about who knew about it and who didn't know about it. It was pure, very amateurishly done. It was done ahead of schedule for reasons which I can discuss. They were totally unprepared and it was quashed within 18 hours. Uh, but what, he, what Erdogan did, who was vacationing in the south at the time, uh, he got one of his assistants uh, to get onto social media and to contact all of the imams, all the priests and all the mosques from one end of Turkey to another and instantaneously told them to go out and start uh, saying that, the, that people were trying to overthrow the government uh, this was anti-democratic, uh, it was a, against the interest of the people, didn't make any difference what your political persuasion was, that this was dangerous. And it, as social media can do, he was able to mobilize people from one end of the country to, uh, an, to another. So this Gezi Park thing in 2013 uh, ends up being uh, expanding well beyond uh, the city limits of Istanbul, there were protests all over the country. By 2016, we now have, a, everybody has a cell phone, everybody's online, everybody uh, participates in this and that social media, and he is able to essentially direct a reaction uh, where people all across the country, not just the pious, but those who at least were educated to believe that the military interventions that have taken place since 1960, again in 1970, again in 1981, uh, that in retrospect everybody said were you know, unacceptable, authoritarian, Kamala's secular overkill. Uh, 
all of a sudden, e even even people who uh, were not biased at all were standing up and saying, Turkey is better than this. We're beyond military. We're uh, beyond military coups. We're out beyond military governments coming in and rewriting our constitutions. So I, since I arrived uh, at here, I arrived a month later to teach that fall, my second semester, and uh, I can tell you that uh, that the general support he had was extraordinary across all, most political lines. But by the time I left in November, in December of 2016, you could see there was a little buyer's remorse. Um, as, as they say, no one wants to let a good uh, crisis go to waste, especially if you have an authoritarian bent. And he established a rule of law, uh, removed the rule of law in Turkey, established a military, uh, essentially martial law in the, in the country and began to continue the purges. The purges no longer just on the military. The purges are now in the courts, in the universities. He's installing rectors in major universities. And the purge uh, begins to, to widen and deepen across the country. And he takes advantage, saying that he's doing this uh, to keep the country from being subverted by the people who supported this. Uh, primarily, he, he believes that it was uh, orchestrated by a guy that he used to work with in that decade, the, the good first decade, he used to work with this this guy, this uh, uh, this imam uh, who lives in the Poconos, uh, Mr. Gulen. Uh, they were they worked hand in glove together until they disagreed on the subject of capitalism and particularly on relations with Israel. Uh, they began to disagree. Anyway, Gulen had actually fled the country by 1999 and residing here uh, in Turkey, and Erdogan uh, to this day claims that he's the one that engineered uh, this, this attempted coup. So uh, he takes an incredible advantage of this situation, and it might interest you to, oops, that's what it looks like in the daytime. For those of you who have not been to uh, Istanbul, and the Bosphorus, which is rather spectacular. Uh, that's what that last scene looks like in the daytime. So this, we see this, this authoritarianism creeping up, becoming more public, more visible, and we've suspicions and concerns in the West uh, rising with every event. So uh, we have also during at the beginning, with you know we have. Arab Spring and uh, Turkey's uh, version of Arab Spring, and we have uh, a war that begins uh, in Syria. And uh, initially, uh, six months before the, the war had broken out, uh, the leaders of both uh, from Damascus and Ankara, had, as families had actually picked, had, had actually vacationed together down on the south coast, and everything was perfect. And six months later were engaged in, in a war effort uh, in Syria. Now, this is the next place where there's a rub with NATO, because it, Turkey pays lip service to the NATO objective of suppressing ISIS and suppressing uh, the regime in Damascus, but in fact focuses 90% of all its efforts in trying to eradicate the uh, PKK Kurdish separatists and their political uh, group that operates there, uh, according, especially according to the Turks, on the southern border of Turkey. And their war is actually uh, against, Turkey's war is essentially against uh, the Kurds and Kurdish separatists, uh, occasionally flying a joint mission with NATO over an ISIS target, or occasionally trying to help uh, stop <coughs> the Damascus regime from expanding. So this is the, it's the first problem now that we're having. So that you go back a decade earlier and you got the problem with Turks saying no to America and NATO uh, creating a second front uh, in uh, Iraq. And now we, we have this situation where the Turks are, are behaving uh, on the surface as though they're part of the NATO alliance, but actually having a rather independent uh, policy uh, and military mission uh, in this area. 
That also includes the fact, I don't think it's any great secret, uh, that also includes the fact that in the early years uh, of, the, of ISIS, uh, Turkey uh, provided safe ha haven to people traveling uh, to, to fight with ISIS. And uh, what Erdogan didn't know is, uh, very, very well uh, was how much a number of them were hold, hanging back in Turkey and creating longer term cells, ISIS cells, uh, in Turkey that would come back later to haunt Erdogan uh, himself. So now we have some problems surfacing uh, between uh, NATO, Turkey, and its major NATO partners over the prosecution of the war in Syria. So uh, this continues. Uh, I mean, 2015, he decides to resume, uh, essentially because he doesn't like the political outcome of an election in June. 2015, uh, where the Kurdish party uh, not only exceeded the 10% minimum threshold to get seats in parliament, but actually uh, secured almost 14% of the vote. That scared Erdogan to death, even more so his coalition partners, uh, who are the nationalists in Turkey. And uh, all of a sudden, this a, a war, after an attempt at finding a peaceful solution, the Kurds, the war was back on and being prosecuted in full uh, against the uh, YPG and PK, PKK uh, separatists. Later in that same year, uh, in 2015, in November, Turkey shoots down a Russian jet that, uh, that air strayed over Turkish airspace for about 16 seconds. I guess that's a long time in jet flight. Uh, managed to get them shot down. And then have, had a real problem on his hands with Russia. But Putin, uh, being of the same school as Erdogan, decided he would uh, mend fences, but, uh, but there would be a price to pay. And they, the two of them uh, you know, begin their in, incredible uh, balancing act, which we'll talk about in a minute, that is going right through the Ukraine war. But you, you never can leave Libya and Syria out of the, the, the equations here when you're looking at, the, uh, at how this act is being, this performance is taking place. So 2015 is kind of disastrous. 2016 uh, is a coup later that fall. I'm teaching there, and the Russian ambassador has assassinated an art gallery in Ankara. Things start to get uh, crazy again. Um, became crazy for us personally, uh, living there, and a bit frightening. <coughs> And then if just when you think that things could not get worse, by 2017, uh, Erdogan and company is in negotiations uh, to basically say, well, if you won't give us the Patriot missiles and the technology that goes with it, they don't talk about that. If you won't give us the Patriot missiles, you're leaving us, we have to protect our country. Our, natural inter our national interest requires us to protect our country. So, we are we talk to the Chinese and we're talking more to the Russians and lo and behold, uh, they go ahead and sign a deal with Putin and the Russians to introduce the S-400 missile batteries in Turkey. Now, <clears throat> the reaction in Washington is almost instantaneous. The Turkish lobby, which had, had become quite significant for the first time in history in that first decade, it dissolves. It essentially dissolves. All the friends disappear running for the hills within a matter of weeks here uh, in Washington. And uh, the Congress decides that they're in violation of, se of selling, of, of doing business uh, with an enemy and put sanctions on Turkey. And um, things could not, you would think they could not possibly have gotten worse. So the net result is that we basically say, and NATO says, you can't have them both. You can't have the Stealth, you're, you're out of the stealth fighter uh, program uh, if you go ahead and, uh, and actualize uh, this system here. Now, uh, these, the, the tension and the conflict with Washington and with Western capitals uh, continues to grow. And this is a balancing act of, you know, Erdogan and Turkey that are totally dependent for, uh, for natural gas 
and oil to the tune of gas alone, uh, I think about 56% of all the requirements in Turkey are met through pipelines that come from Russia. There's a, there, Turkey is a huge wheat importer uh, from Russia, all, incidentally also from Ukraine, uh, to, to feed its people. Uh, Turkey is totally, de is significantly dependent on Russian tourism. Uh, after the jet was shot down and uh, various agreements were made, all of a sudden, the tourism business, uh, Russians who, who said, you know, Odessa, Odessa is, an, is, is not bad, but compared to Antalya, not, no contest. To the point where prior to COVID, uh, there were roughly 750,000 uh, uh, Russian tourists coming every year, which was one of the ways to help fix the uh, balance of payments for the Turks to be able to pay uh, for their gas bills. But it also, but, but Erdogan's also looking at, uh, okay, Russia has managed to insert itself in the Middle East where it had been booted out since 1953, it inserted itself uh, in the Assad regime and in Syria and has not only has a naval base there, but has subsequently built an air base there. And um, I, I, we, I, we, Erdogan, and our party and our country, I need to find some kind of an agreement, uh, if not public, at least quiet, to help manage uh, the situation in Syria because the refugees, the number in excess of four and a half million that have come in as co a course over the course of this civil war have become a, a political liability to the current regime uh, in Turkey and they need cooperation uh, from Russia to try uh, to act on Erdogan's latest pre-election promise is that he plans to repatriate one million Syrians, probably to the Idlib area, back into uh, northwestern uh, uh, Iraq on the southern border of Turkey, and he will need Russian help to do that. Uh, that's also part of the calculation, uh, not the main part, but part of the calculation on Sweden and Finland, which we'll talk about. So this balancing act is quite fascinating. Here's the, Russia is also de helping them to develop two nuclear reactors. Provides the vast majority uh, of their energy, huge amount of wheat, a lot of tourism. So uh, on the other hand, uh, Turkey has had a problem with Russia uh, by, according to, to my book there, since uh, 1699, uh, it got terribly difficult under Catherine, the great uh, regime, and uh, have, trying to have cordial relations with their, with their uh, the, the country to their north has always been problematic. So let me also speak on behalf of the, uh, the independence and sovereignty of Crimea, sacrificed by Russian invasion in 2014. Let me also support the Turkic elements of the Ukrainian population so that we get some balance, some negotiating power from Istanbul vis-a-vis -vis Moscow. And by the way, why don't we sell them these, these uh, about 35% of the cost of an American copy equivalent, sell them these drones, the Bayraktar 2B2 drones, which had proved to be very successful uh, for the Libyans and had been used very successfully in Nagorno-Karabakh and now used very successfully in, I will say, the saving of Kiev. Uh, with those, all those Russian military assets lined up on the highways, they're a fairly easy target. And this, is this, this guy is the son-in-law of Erdogan who started uh, this company about 25, 20, 22 years ago very successful now, and they're exporting these uh, to lots of countries. Uh, and this basically, this is, you can see the date on this. This is a couple of weeks before war breaks out. So one of the Russian subs is now coming through uh, the Bosphorus on its way back to Sevastopol, to its home port. It brings to, uh, that's Suleimanie uh, in the background there on the Bosphorus, in the old city, the Sultan city. And here's a ship heading north into the Black Sea, which brings to, to, to mind one of the other terrific assets, which 
Turkey is using marvelously, which is the, the, the 1936 Maltra Treaty that essentially gives Turkey control under, uh, if there are belligerents, identified belligerents involved, control uh, traffic, ship traffic through the Bosphorus, including military ship traffic. So here's this ship, probably perfectly aware that something is going to happen uh, and in short order and is returning to its home base because you're allowed to return the, the, the way that Erdogan is, and his regime are interpreting the current situation is that you can sail into the Black Sea if you have a home port there for ships that are home ported there. That could be Romanian ships, for example. So here's this ship, you know, quietly going through the Bosphorus. I used to see these ships and cruise ships. Uh, my wife and I lived uh, in a place called Bebek, right up the river here. And you could shoot postcards from our, our bedroom and our garden. But one of the, we had a spectacular view of the Bosphorus. And we watched cruise ships. We also watched uh, watch subs and military ships, typically about 6 o'clock in the morning, quietly going through. So, but this, this, this balancing act that Erdogan is engaged in is, has historic roots. Uh, we had a, a war, the Crimean War, where Western powers had to come support of the Ottoman Empire to prop it up uh, un, under the large rubric of the notion of the Eastern question. This is the cartoon version. But you see the Russian bear there, with, uh, if not from Peter, at least from Catherine's time forward, felt that it was the rightful heir to Byzantium when it was conquered uh, by, the, by the Turks, that it should by rights should be rescued by the Russian Orthodox and the, the Russians. Uh, have a primary claim, after all, they accepted uh, Christianity uh, in Kiev, Vladimir the First in Kiev, because his ministers had gone down and seen, seen Justinian's incredible uh, Saint Sophia mosque and, and the power and the majesty uh, and the sacredness of, of this religion means we should, we you know, we Russians will now be Orthodox. They've had it there, so they've had military interest and commercial and economic interest that go reach down in following Greek Orthodox Greek Orthodox lines uh, into the Balkans and coming into the Middle East, uh, Middle East and Persia. So I happened to be there in 2016 in the fall. Uh, we had a fall break and I went up to Moscow and flew down uh, to Crimea and here I'm, I hired a little ship and was taking some pictures that I sure as hell was hoping to make sure I got out of Turkey, but without anybody seeing what I had on my smartphone. But there are a couple, an old Ameri couple of American rusting ships now in 2016 after Russia had seized Crimea, and a, a Ukrainian training ship. And I continued around the bay in Sevastopol. And here's a Russian sub pen, which made me even more nervous about getting out of the country. And uh, when you talk about the Black Sea and all know the, the story of this incredible battleship. Now, how, do, how does Erdogan take advantage? How does he take advantage in his balancing act with the Russians? He comes to their rescue a month and a half ago. But it's a Bayraktar a drone that is used to, uh, to fool the radar systems on the Moscow ship. And it's a Neptune missile that comes, comes streaking in load that hits the ship. Uh, but it's a Bayraktar 2 drone used by the Ukrainians to distract uh, the people on the ship, and they're following this, and this missile's coming in low over the water. And lo and behold, we have a, a fire on the ship. And uh, that's, how, that's how it happens. So here's Turkey coming to help his buddy up in the north. Uh, so it, it brings us now to the election that's coming up in a year. Uh, this is my good friend here in Washington, uh, Soner Chaptai. I'll let you just read that. Ec Turkey's economic slide, uh, foreign direct investment plummeting, uh, domestic terrorism leading to a decline in tourism and hard currency flows, political interference in the central bank by Erdogan and company, uh, losing uh, international market confidence, the currency itself uh, being deflated 
horrendously last year and inflation hitting upwards of 70% right now in Turkey. And you can see a decline from, 20, from 15 to 21 at 5 billion in foreign direct investment. Uh, Erdogan is gunslinging. He's paying a very, the instability in Turkey, uh, which is its greatest asset. If it has it, it's incredibly valuable to everybody. If it doesn't have it, it's a, it's a danger and a liability to everybody associated with it. So here we are. Uh, th this guy is the, won the mayoral election here, a huge upset in 2019. The opposition won most of the big cities, including uh, Istanbul. So here's on the right Erdogan, who was once upon a time mayor, talking to Ekrem uh, Imamoglu, uh, who is the new mayor, uh, who I, whose name we will see in politics going forward. This is the ruling party coalition with the nationalist movement party. Here are the opposition parties and their leaders. Uh, the opposition is basically trying to uh, regain a rule of law, reinstitute a strong parliament, and remove uh, a lot of the executive privileges uh, in the absence of checks and balances uh, have become uh, tools. Uh, as of 2018, when Erdogan uh, becomes a president, an executive president in Turkey. So, as we look forward to the election, you can see he has plenty of support. And uh, the question here, another friend of mine here in Washington at Brookings, Kamal Kudishji, wrote this article. So I've, what I'm I've got here, in this election, it's the tale of two turkeys. Is the Islamist movement and direction in the country going to prevail, or is the secular Kemalist going to prevail a year from now in this coming election? Everything is on the rise. Here we have a very secular-looking Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the hero of Gallipoli, and you see uh, the leader of uh, Erdogan and his wife. Justinian St. Sophia. We go from basilica to mosque, the conquering in 1453, to museum under Ataturk two years ago. Erdogan reinstitutes uh, St. Sophia as a mosque. So here's this the secular side. This is the fourth issue in the first year of publication, Time Magazine, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the hero of Gallipoli, him the republic that he established. Pretty authoritarian guy himself, by the way. Um, you know, or is Erdogan's monument to himself on the Asian side of the Bosphorus, his political headquarters in Istanbul, right next door, no surprise. And so these are uh, the risk factors that we're looking at. Uh, you know, does the Erdogan era come to an end? Do we, does Turkey uh, come into a better alignment uh, you can see, I don't believe they do. Ukraine, Ukraine is not really a litmus test. He's taking and running with it for all it's worth. And we feel like we owe him in the West. America feels like we owe him something for this. On the other hand, how does he pay us back? You know, one out, one out of 30 members says no. Finland, Finland and Sweden can't because of their support of PKK terrorists. Well, Germany has PKK terrorists. Turkey has Hamas terrorists. Uh, and uh, and he is a man who will, you know, one month and a half ago said, we're going uh, we're gonna to sit down with the Greeks and iron this thing out, and uh, we're going to have, we're going to figure out a solution and stop fighting about the islands and the militarization uh, of the Aegean coast and the, and the east. And then uh, they start flying jets over each other constantly since then, and he takes it off the table two days ago. So, no, see. So now Israel is in because they want a pipeline and they want the business. Israel is in, but he sent their their ministers uh, packing, uh, the ambassadors packing five years ago. So now he wants to reestablish that. He's got an election coming. He's got America. He's got an Israeli lobby to deal with. He has a, so let's make nice with everybody and see if next year I can survive the, the economy. Uh, which is in a train wreck, if I can survive that and stay in office and uh, 
stay in power and keep the opposition out of power. So you, the people that tend to benefit from this instability, by the way, of course, are the Russians and the Chinese. So I'm open to any questions that people have, uh, and I hope you found it. It was a lot in a short period of time. Yes, sir. Uh, that's an excellent question. I think the answer is no. The sentiment in Washington uh, is, is just so negative right now. What he's hoping for is that in exchange for the uh, balancing act that he is providing between Russia and Ukraine and the negotiations that are taking place, including Russian oligarchs, since there are no sanctions against Russians uh, as far as Turkey is concerned, unlike the rest of NATO, uh, I think what they're looking for uh, is... Uh, they want to be able to update uh, their Air Force with a whole new round of uh, F-16 purchases. And in particular, there are some upgrades that they would like to buy to the current F-16 fleet they have. But they want both. And, they wa and, and the reason they, they want them is because they see uh, the Greeks uh, investing now in for further fortifying uh, some of their islands on the Aegean coast, they see the Greeks uh, investing over, well over 2% uh, of their GNP on their military. They've got Russia as a neighbor in the north. They have inevitable problems uh, in, in Syria. And now we have issues in the eastern Mediterranean over these enterprise economic zones and the possibility of huge wealth uh, for underwater uh, natural uh, energy resources, uh, the center of which is Cyprus and the politics that extend uh, from Turkey to Athens uh, to Tripoli and uh, across to uh, Cairo and up to Israel. So um, I think the answer is, 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 a, is a hell no on the F-35, but we've got, we're going to have to give them something. And uh, he, wants, he wants Russian support in Syria and is at least a promise to repatriate uh, a million Syrians uh, with this election coming in. So there's a lot of posturing going on right now in connection with the election. The thing that isn't changing is the economy. It, it, it just continues to tank. Another question, sir. All right, well, I, I think in, in a nutshell, Turkey sort of get, got a lot out of the nagorno karabakh deal. They would have gotten more, but the Russians came in and said, no, this is enough. Uh, we'll, get, we'll create a commercial corridor between nagorno karabakh and the Turkish border. And the Azerbaijanis are uh, completely, you know, are significantly dependent uh, on Turkish help. So uh, Turkey's, uh, again, this is, this is, you know, a... a a finger in the eye of Russia. Wherever they can, they have to also put a finger in the eye of Russia. And and that includes, your first question was on, yeah, I, I think right now, he, Erdogan, clever fellow that he is, has decided that, uh, that NATO's hands are tied right now, that negotiations are taking place. This is the perfect time. The fighting season has begun uh, f for them to head back down and garner some domestic political support by uh, saying we need a defensive corridor to protect us against Rojava, to, to protect us against uh, the Kurds, the separatists, and their influence in Turkey, and oh, my nationalist co coalition partners, don't you love me? So the answer is we're not, gonna, we're not in a position to do anything about it right now, at least publicly. But it's, one, it's another thing that says, you know, no F-35. We may give you some upgrades. So it's a horse it's a horse trading exchange going on. Yes, sir.
Turkey's aid, foreign aid, yes, enormous in Africa. I'm sorry, couldn't hear you. Yes. Yeah, he just the the architect of the uh, of the Istanbul victory mayoral election in 2019 was just sentenced to four years. It might be suspended, but he was just sentenced. So again, he just keeps everybody off balance on every on every subject. So I. I the issue is, will, might he try to call a snap election? If the economy weren't so bad, I would say he might. I think calling a snap election right now uh, would, be, would be even riskier for him because he thinks that he can pull a number of rabbits out of the hat in the course of the next year. Let me have some victories in Syria. Let me get, let me get some stuff from America. Let me, let me make sure Putin is happy with us. Ukraine is happy with us. We look good. We're on the stage. We're punching above our weight in negotiations. But He's trying to leverage all of this stuff right now. So that would be my answer uh, to your question. Yes, ma'am. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Istanbul. Well, I, th I think when you talk to the common man, the common man is there's no value in throwing him into jail. So I think the common man feels a little bit freer to talk than they did. I mean, for years, people that were educated, who were secular and so forth. I mean, we we did we did emails together where the first letter was left off uh, off the first word in the first sentence, so it couldn't be picked up in searches by mit by I. I mean, that was a kind of police state feeling that many the common folk say all kinds of things. You, yeah. I'm not, it, it's as bad or worse. So, but, but the common man can now say all kinds of things now because he's not really a, a, a target. You learn a lot from, from hearing. And the answer is yes. A lot of his support has waned 
dramatically, especially when he, he called the 2019 Istanbul election, where there was a 13,000 vote difference, and, and said that he claimed that, the, that there was monkey business done, and gets the Constitutional Court to require them to uh, have another election. And three month, two and a half months later, uh, uh, Imam Olu wins by 835,000. So what happened is the people in his own party said, this is absurd. This guy is, he's, I don't think he's as pious as we think he is. He's a political opportunist and is showing all the signs of all the corruption of all officials that we thought we were getting rid of when we hired him 20 years ago. But 20 years ago is a long time. But you, you, getting back to your question in the back of the room there, uh, Tur Turkey's, Turkey's interest in Africa, of course, it goes back historically when they controlled everything in the Maghreb. Uh, except Morocco, uh, and had, had had actually had businesses all all the way down Mogadishu and the Horn and so forth. They're now going into the vacuum since the United States hasn't been as proactive in in Africa as the Chinese have been. Uh, they were, the Turks are saying, "Well, let me go in on the back uh, on the backs of the Chinese." They're showing us how it's done. I won't talk about the Uyghurs too much. So that the Chinese will let me go ahead and expand embassies. And it turned out that these embassies and their influence was actually comes from the, the first decade of the economic miracle, which is Turkish Air, went and set up, and set up uh, airports. Wherever the, the Turks created a diplomatic mission, they set up an airport. Now everybody and his brother flies to Brazil or Vietnam through Istanbul now, by the way. And THY is the top airline five years running. Uh, in Europe, but this is part of this is a natural uh, reach for him again to ex with smaller amounts of money to curry significant favor in pockets of Africa. So um, I think we have time for one more, sir. I remember the, the pious, the people that support him, for the sake of discussion, let's say 10 years ago, 50% of the people, either because of business or religion or a combination of the two. But you remember the, the Muslims were marginalized too. You know, and so what you were seeing with Muslims in Turkey was a natural sympathy for what was happening to Uyghurs and what was happening to Tatars from Stalin's time going forward, and Turkey providing a home uh, in, in 1944. So, I think the, the fact of the matter is when you take, it's like Germany, when you take 58% of your energy comes from Turkey, uh, all of a sudden you, you're not nearly as independent as you would like people to believe. And they're building two of your uh, uh, nuclear plants for you and shipping wheat to keep your people from rebellion in your country. Russians have a lot of leverage uh, on Erdogan. Uh, I, I think our time has run out. I'd be happy to field that question uh, uh, afterwards. But anyway, I want to thank you all uh, for coming uh, today and to um, encourage you to continue to recognize the fact that no matter what anybody says uh, about the Middle East, it never has and it ain't never going away. So you can try to pivot to Asia all day long, but you're going to have to continue to keep an eye out on this part of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Henry Williams, and thank you to everyone else who has come to join us today, even the people online. Um, if you would like to support IWP by making a gift, a donation, or learning more about our graduate programs, please visit iwp.edu. And just um, one note, we do have to rearrange this room for a classroom, so if anybody has any questions for Dr. Williams, you can please just ask them outside of the classroom for me. Thank you again for coming.